Yo, what's good, Knicks Nation? Alex Jeteris here, a.k.a. the Tradicaster, back again with another Game of the Week preview. This time we are previewing the New York Knicks facing the Miami Heat at the Miami Dade Arena at 8 p.m. on Friday night. And with me today to preview this game is none other than Wes Goldberg. You can find his work over at Walked On Heat. He is one of the hosts for that podcast as well. He's got bylines at the Ringer and the Miami Herald. But before we ask Wes how he's doing and get into this preview, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. And make sure to remember that this show is sponsored by KnicksFanTV.com. And with that being said, Wes, my man, how are you doing today? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. You know, this is going to be a good discussion right here. Knicks heat. This is just history in the making. We all know how much both these fan bases hate each other. You know, we got to get this one. We had to get this one on the dock. We just had to make sure this one was going to be previewed for this week. Some big implications, especially with the Brooklyn Nets, you know, tearing down their roster. Miami Heat are seem to be surging at the right time to now get back up into the playoffs. Knicks are surging at the right time as well. So this is a good matchup to see where things are going to kind of shake out in the East. And also, we got we got to face each other two more times this month as well. So with that being said, how do you feel about the Miami Heat this season overall? Uh, honestly, overall, um, you mentioned they're surging, and it doesn't really feel like that recently. They they lost four in a row and then beat the Philadelphia 76ers on Monday night, and then they lost to the Sixers uh, last night, Wednesday night. Um, and so they've lost four out of five, and they gave James Harden a pretty good look at the end of the game on Monday night. So if Harden makes that three, we could be talking about a team that lost six straight. Um, it's been a little frustrating, and you can you could talk to coaches and players uh, on the Miami Heat, and and they're starting to get a little frustrated. It just feels like, yeah, they're 33 and 30. They're right there in the thick of the playoff race. But this was also a team that was number the number one seed in the Eastern Conference last season. And um, I think they've been a little frustrated with the fact that it never really feels like they have been able to get back to that quality, that level of play. Uh, they're missing a lot of shots. They're the one of the worst three-point shooting teams in the NBA. That's dragging the offense down. Uh, defensively, they're still elite. They're still one of the top five defenses in the league. That's always going to be the case with the Miami Heat team. But um, mm -hmm. overall, they just haven't really hit that standard that that they set for themselves, which is admittedly very high. But um, it is it has been a little frustrating, nonetheless, to kind of feel like, is this just sort of a, a slightly above average basketball team after being one shot away from the finals last year? Oh, man. That's interesting to hear, you know, because from what I hear and like, I don't follow the heat religiously as like you do, you, you cover them on a day-to-day -day basis. But from what I've heard is that, you know, this is a gritty team. They, you know, you get Jimmy Butler back. I know he missed some time. You got Bam Adebayo down there. You got Tyler Hero. And between those three, it seems like you have a good core there to make it competitive on a night-to-night -night basis. And for that, it feels like even though that these losses are occurring for them, it feels that the heat, are not too far though from being like a six seed and making some sort of noise in the playoffs. Am I am I right on that, or do you think it's much further than that? No, I, I think that's that's fair. You know, they're only a, what a game and a half behind Brooklyn for the number six seed. They've got a game lead in the loss column over the Hawks for that six seed, or I'm sorry, for the seventh seed. And so yeah, they're they're in okay position. I just think that the Heat themselves felt like they would be in a better spot right now. I, I asked Eric Spolster about this uh, before the game last night. And I and I said, like, based on where you guys are on the standings, does every do you guys feel like this is almost preseason to the playoffs right now? Like this is the playoffs before the playoffs. And he said, Yeah. And they didn't want to feel that way. They kind of mm -hmm. they wanted to feel like they could be a little bit more comfortable at this situation instead of battling right now to, to avoid the play in tournament. This is this team does not want to play in the play in tournament. The one thing about this team is that they're old and they are injury prone. And so even adding another game or two is risky. For this group they want to they want to get out of the playing tournament a real playoff spot get that number six seed and then whatever the matchup is is the matchup and at that point yeah i think the heat are confident about what they could do in the playoffs i, I have no doubt about that they're gritty no when you when you hear that no team wants to face the miami heat in a playoff series believe it like i don't think that there's a team in the eastern conference that wants to see miami in a playoff series but getting there and what miami looks like once they get there um, it's just been a little bit more of a struggle, I think, this year than they anticipated. Gotcha. And so, you know, recently the the, the Heat went out and made some moves. They got in, they brought in Kevin Love because he was bought out by the Cleveland Cavaliers, and they also got Cody Zeller as well. What do you make of those two additions to the Miami Heat? So it, it's been interesting. Cody Zeller was immediately inserted into the starting lineup at power forward, which I found surprising because coaches don't hmm. really do that. 
Kevin Love hmm. was out of the rotation in Cleveland. Um, he gets bought out and he he gets signed to Miami. And coaches are usually pretty conservative with this kind of thing. Like, all right, he's new. Let him kind right. of work his way in off the bench and kind of figure out the system. And Spo was like, no, just throw him out there. He's going to be your starting power <laughs> forward now. And uh, and and look, the the results have been. I think things have looked very different. It's still too early to tell uh, uh, whether he makes any sort of meaningful difference in terms of their ceiling and what they're going to be able to do. It's only been three games with Kevin Love. But in terms of just how the team looks, it does look very different. First of all, they were playing Caleb Martin, who's a 6'5 perimeter player at power mm -hmm. forward for the first 60 games of this season. Wow. And Kevin Love is the only true power forward that they have on the roster. And so that's part of the reason why when they brought him in, they just started him at power forward. And so he's also Kevin Love, you know, respected three-point shooter, great rebounder, all these things. Um, Caleb Martin was more dynamic with the ball and all this and all this other stuff. And, and definitely better defensively, jumping passing lanes, creating turnovers. But with Kevin Love, it kind of just feels more like a, a traditional kind of positional alignment. And then obviously with the three-point shooting, it's created some more spacing. His screen setting has been really important early on. The rebounding has been an immediate value add. Um, and so, yeah, the Kevin Love thing has been, um, I think, a, a, a good addition, a helpful addition. But time will tell how helpful that addition has been. And then in terms of Cody Zeller, I've been shocked by how good he looks. Like Miami's mm. backup center minutes behind Bam Adebayo were a crater before they got Cody Zeller. It was not a great Dwayne Dedman season. They were relying a lot on, on two-way players and, and small ball lineups and things like that. Um, and so they go out and get Cody Zeller, who hasn't played since early last season. He broke his leg, had to go up through a whole surgery, uh, surgery and rehab process. And you think, okay, after all that, you probably take a little while to get into game shape and conditioning. No. Like, I saw him in his first practice. The dude's chiseled. He's in game shape. He's playing three-on-threes after practice. Uh, he looks wow. great. You watch him on the court, and you're like, this guy's getting up and down the court. Uh, you talk to coaches and like, yeah, his conditioning is off the charts right now. Like everybody is sort of surprised. So they they brought him in for a workout. They were obviously impressed. They signed him um, along with uh, Kevin Love, and and he immediately has taken those backup center minutes and turned them into something positive, uh, where before they just weren't. Interesting, interesting. So Cody Zeller seems like a good ad. I think I just want to stick on Kevin Love for a second because sure. you know he was out of the rotation in Cleveland. So is there any concern now that while he I guess since he got out of the rotation in Cleveland that he might not live up to the expectation of what Heat fans or even what the Miami Heat, the organization themselves, may get from him. It comes down to three-point shooting with him. Like the rebounding, the screen setting, the basketball IQ, the outlet passing, all that stuff that is sort of the Kevin Love stuff has been there right away. But for him to meet those expectations – the three-point shot's got to go down. I mentioned it earlier, but Miami's in the bottom three in the league in three-point shooting percentage. After being the best three-point shooting team in the league last year, mm -hmm. they are looking. They were not only looking for size, but they were also looking for help in that respect and in, in making threes. And Kevin Love, he's averaging more than five three-point attempts a game for the Heat through three games, but he's only making them at like 24%. So I know that he's coming off of that finger injury and things like that, and he was out of the rotation, so maybe he's a little rusty. I don't know. But for him to really meet the expectations and make a meaningful difference to the Miami Heat this season, that 24% three-point clip needs to be way higher. I mean, we're talking like it has to be closer to like 36, 37, 38%, kind of what you'd expect from Kevin Love. Yeah, for sure. That makes that now that makes sense. They make sense. And now when you look at this roster and the way that's constructed, like I said, you're bringing Cody Zeller, you got Kevin Love. You have a lot of these same guys returning, right? Obviously, Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, Tyler Hero is your core. You got Kyle Lowry still. Um, you got Gabe Vincent, Max Truss. Do you see this team being ready to make a deep run in the playoffs? Or do you think that you're another player away? Because in your recent article for the ringer, right? For how far can culture take the heat? You, you, you mentioned that you lost some key guys like PJ Tucker, right? From this past off season, but the whole aspect is that if you're bringing the same guys and you're not bringing anyone big like a Kevin Durant or Donovan Mitchell, and you said it right in that article, is that guys got to take on that additional role, right? They got to expand their game. So have you seen enough from this team that they've expanded their game where they don't need another player? Or do you still think they need another player? Move uh, like, And obviously they can't do it this season, but moving forward. Um, so far, they have not seen the expanded 
uh, responsibilities and roles and just skill set from the players that they brought back and were hoping. I think Caleb Martin is really the only guy who has sort of adapted. He was a kind of a energy bench guy last year who was definitely helpful and then adapted and became a starter and he's much more versatile and he's much better defensively. Like the, Caleb Martin is now a, a player that this team trusts in the playoffs. Not that they didn't last year, but more so even this year. But Kyle Lowry has fallen off. You know, like mm. he he was not playing well prior to this knee injury. He just recently was ruled out for Friday night's game against the Knicks. So he's not even gonna be a part of that one. But then, mm-hmm. you, you know, that that puts more on Gabe Vincent, who's the only other real point guard on this roster. He's had moments, but consistently it hasn't been there. Max Struess, he was a 40 percent shooter last year. He's shooting like 34, 35 percent this year. It, it, he's regressed, you know, mm-hmm. um, a lot of these guys, instead of improving, have regressed and. So when you talk about what it is that the Heat are looking for, I, I think it's the supporting cast around that that trio that you talked about. Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, and Tyler Hero. Those guys are legit. That is a core. Jimmy Butler's a top 15 guy. Bam Adebayo's a top 20, 25 guy. Tyler Hero's sort of a top 70 guy in the NBA. Like, those are legit players. And Tyler Hero's got, you know, a high ceiling and nothing but better basketball in front of him. Um, beyond that, I don't know that they have, like, an above-average player at their position at this point based on what this season has has shaped up to be and so not I, they're either a player away like a star player away from basically saying well the supporting cast doesn't even matter anymore because we have three super legit stars now mm-hmm. um or they're several players away because it, it kind of feels like they have to reshape the supporting cast around that that group okay and moving on to that supporting cast around that group right like you paid Tyler Hero I could see Bam being there, you know, once again, going back to your article, you talked about how Udonis has him last season. Bam is like that voice now moving forward for the, for this team, right? Jimmy Butler, where does, where, where does he stand in this whole equation? Because he's on the older side. We know how gritty he is. He fits like heat culture perfectly, but is this a guy that the heat are going to continue to like keep on this roster moving forward do you expect like a trade coming down like maybe next season or something along those lines it's a great question and i think it's a question that this front office might have to ask themselves in an honest moment this coming summer because they don't want to trade jimmy butler let me first put that out there they don't want to trade jimmy butler they want to add to jimmy butler but in order to do that it's gonna it's gonna cost them a lot it's gonna cost them another player that they don't want to get rid of um, it's going to cost assets, and I don't know that they're going to find the star that they want to add to Jimmy Butler. Like, you could on paper say something like Zach Levine or Bradley Beal, but like, really, if you add Beal to this group, if you add Zach Levine to this group, are they up there with Milwaukee and Boston? No, the, especially considering that you'll have to deplete whatever depth you you already have now and whatever assets that you have uh, going forward. So I, I don't. That seems kind of fun and competitive and interesting, but I don't think it's nearly what Boston or Milwaukee are. Uh, in the Eastern Conference, and then, okay, so if that, what kind of star, can you get that super level star? Can They were involved in Kevin Durant for a reason, right? Like, that's mm-hmm. the kind of player that they were after. Kevin, Kevin Durant's not going to happen anymore, obviously. So if that player isn't coming to Miami, then what do you do? All right, well, then maybe you try to tinker with the rest of the supporting cast, kind of get this group up, but that's going to cost you some other things. I think they're going to try to unload Kyle Lowry and or Duncan Robinson, one of those salaries, because they're going to be deep in the luxury tax next year. Mm -hmm. Can you do those things? All right. If the answer is yes, I think you do those things and you go into next season having done those things. If the answer is no, if they don't have the assets that it takes to, because they're going to have to, you know, use first round picks and draft capital to, to basically unload Kyle Lowry and Duncan Robinson, and they might not be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. So then what do you do? Then you might be kind of staring in the mirror and saying, we might have to trade Jimmy Butler because they're not going to trade Bam Adebayo. He's absolutely untouchable. And so, um, it might get to the point where they say this run has kind of went came to the end, and this is this the run is over here with what this mm-hmm. was. Um, two chances at the NBA Finals. It was a good run, but ultimately they might have to do kind of what like Utah just did, and some other teams saying, "Hey, we kind of took this as far as we could. Maybe it's time to just hit hit a soft reset button, trade Jimmy Butler, get assets back, and then start rebuilding around Bam out of bio as opposed to building around Jimmy." Now. What I just listed out, there's a lot of steps, obviously, between now right. and where you get there. But I, I would be, I, I do think that it is a possibility. There's a percentage chance that the Heat do get there as soon as the summer. Okay, okay, and and you know, let me throw this wrench because there's a guy that we all know that he, he played with back in Philadelphia, 
that you know we saw like the tears the tweets and everything one in one Joel Embiid do you think that there would be any route that the Miami Heat go get someone like Joel Embiid to go get like a star and would they be would they even consider moving someone like Bam Adebayo to take over that center position for someone like Joel would they consider it? I'm sure they could, would consider it. I mean, when you're talking about like A-list talent, that's I mean, Joel Embiid is is uh, that's as A-list as it as it gets right now, right? I mean, mm-hmm. so I they would consider it. The, the hang up there is that when you look at this roster, their position of strength right now is at center, right? And so mm-hmm. and you can't play Bam and Embiid together, so you would have to trade Bam, and I'm sure the Sixers would want Bam. And it would take Bam plus some other stuff. It would take draft picks. Maybe it would also include Tyler Hero. Like, who knows? Right, right, it would right. take other stuff. Um, I think the Heat would entertain it. I, I don't know that they would be willing to pull that trigger again and, 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 and kind of put all of their assets on the table because that right now, center is a position of strength for them. I think they would prefer to try to improve some other spots. I don't know. I, it's a great question. I, I, would, I would love to know like what Pat Riley and Andy Ellisberg in, the, in that front office really thinks about it but they love Bam Adebayo. They really, really do. And so that's part of it. The other part of it too is even if you do put whatever you have on the table, I I think there's other teams, your Knicks included, who could beat that offer. Uh, and when you when you factor in all the draft assets and st- and young players and role players and, and, and value add salaries that they could put on the table and, and something like that, it, I, if it might be hard for the Heat to get there, of course, there might not not there might not be a centerpiece as good as Bam mm-hmm. being made available by any other team. But I'll go back to what I just said. The Heat love Bam, and I, I don't know that they view that what it would take. Uh, I I don't know that they would view that upgrade worth what it would take. In other words, uh, considering that Bam is probably already their best player. Okay, and so you know when you look at that, the trade speculation, what we just broke down, like maybe moving Jimmy Butler, you know, the theory of maybe even like trying to go get someone like Joel Embiid and what that may even look like. There's a guy that's just been able to do a great job of just masking a lot of those, you know, flaws and def- deficiencies on the team. And that is one Eric Spolstra, right? He's been a great coach for the Miami Heat. He's won what, two championships with them during the LeBron era? Or yeah. was he? Yeah, that's when he, yeah. He wasn't there for he's, no I'm going crazy. He was I wasn't going, going he, crazy. He's now. got he has three rings, uh, but he was not the he was an assistant coach on the Dwayne Wade 2006 yes. title. Yeah. Right. He was not, yeah. That's I was like, was he with the Heat as an assistant? <laughs> I was thinking about I was like, pretty sure that's the story. That, but thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. So yeah. he's got three, so he's got three rings with them. You know, great coach, able to scheme up everything and anything to help this team. I mean, look, you're talking about a shot away going to the finals last year, made a finals appearance. With Jimmy, Duncan Robinson, all these guys to face uh, LeBron James in the bubble. Tell me a little bit about Eric Spolster, man, because, you know, before Tibbs, before this Knicks run, right? Before seven game winning streak, you know, 10 games above 500, Knicks fans, we have gripes with every little thing about this roster because 20 years, you know, we've, we haven't seen that much success. And especially when you have someone who's old school like Tibbs. We look at guys like Eric Spolster and we're like, yo, look at the look at the creative genius that he's doing for offense. Of course, the defense is gonna be fine. But look at that offensive creativity. And now, like, even though the Knicks are now top 10 in offense, which is just mind-blowing to think about a Tom Thibodeau team, top 10 offense <laughs> with the with, with the Knicks. You look at Spolster and it's like, what if we had that guy? So give me a little <laughs> details about Eric Spolstra and his whole uh, I guess everything about him being a Miami Heat head coach. Well, you're talking to like the number one Spo guy right now. I, I, I think that, I think he's the best coach in the NBA. I, I've thought that for a very long time. When you think, when you talk about everything that goes involved, that that's involved in coaching, right? And and I know there's there's things that like on social media that gets a lot of attention, like a, a great ATO, you know, play design or stuff like that. It's like, all right, cool, like that stuff's fine. Um, but it that's such a small fraction of what coaching really is in the NBA. Mm-hmm. And to me. The biggest thing about coaching is setting a culture, um, a philosophy, and getting your players to buy in, not just to winning, but to their roles that re- that they might not even think is the right way to win. And you got to get them to believe, no, if you kind of buy into maybe a smaller role or a different role than you were expecting, that's going to help the team win, and then we're all going to eat, right? And, I agree and that, with that 100%. 
that's such a huge part of it. And then, and then obviously it's the developmental part, the skill work, all the behind the scenes, the practicing, the, uh, the evolution of a team as a, as a season goes on to keep opponents guessing, not just running the same stuff all like over and over again. And so it's the day to day behind the scenes stuff that, that it, kind of the more big picture stuff that I don't think gets a lot of attention. And that's the stuff that Spo is, is best at. Right. Um, and uh, I, when you talk to NBA people, when you talk to people in the league, around the league, who really observe the league in, um, in a critical way, everybody puts Spo near or at the top of their list of best coaches in the NBA. He's got nothing but respect from opposing coaches um, he, a lot of his sets are, are stolen by opposing coaches. Uh, you know, stealing plays is a common thing in the NBA. Like Eric Spolstra is sort of like, it's like Eric Spolstra, Brad Stevens, when he was still coaching and like Steve Kerr, like those are the guys that get their stuff stolen the most. Um, and then you talk to guys like Brad Stevens and Steve Kerr who are, you know, have been around the NBA for a long time, but not nearly as long as Spo has been at the helm of the Miami Heat. Only Greg Popovich has been running his team longer than Eric Spolstra has. Um, and they just they revere the guy. They said that's the gold standard. That's what everybody wants. And in a league where coaches are fired, sometimes mid season, sometimes teams are going through two or three coaches in a single season. The fact that Spo mm-hmm. has been around for twenty years is is remarkable. And it's just it's sort of unheard of, but it speaks to everything that he's got going on uh, in Miami. And then just to continue gushing a little bit more, um, I, I think early in his career he didn't get a lot of credit because it was sort of like Pat Riley and he's sort of the puppet master and Eric Spolster is just sort of doing his bidding that could not be further from the truth. I, I, I just, Pat Riley has a strong presence in that building to this day. There's no doubt. I, about I it. can only imagine as a Knicks fan, I can only imagine yeah. the strong presence. I'm sorry. I brought up the P word, but um, <laughs> yeah, you t- you brought up the Sith Ward himself. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I, the, the other thing about like kind of the heat's culture, not, and I'm not saying it with like a hashtag or capital letters, but like their, their, their business culture, the way that they do things. Pat Riley came in and instilled a certain way of doing things and people have come through that organization and evolved that business culture in certain ways. And Eric Spolstra has, has, has had as much to do with Miami's culture as Pat Riley has at this point, because he's been in charge that long because he's sort of led the player development program. And he's really led this team into more of a modern form where Pat Riley was just like elbow pads at practice, kind of that kind of thing. Spo is a little bit more modern and can speak to the modern player. So he's been really important. And, and I still think he's, he's pitching his fastballs uh, still, even now. I don't know that he's, you look at this team, they're 33 and 30. It's kind of hard to see why sometimes coaching is a big part of that. Obviously it's not all of it. Jimmy gets a lot of credit. Bam. Tyler's mm-hmm. hit a number of game winners. A lot of players have, have stepped up this year in, in different ways at different times, but Spo is, is the constant. Okay. And with Spolstra, right? Like, I guess my next question for you is like, uh, uh, like, or has there been, been any gripes with Spolstra as, as a head coach throughout his tenure as a Miami? Because sometimes and it happens for all fan bases, right? Like, there's just like something that they got to nitpick on. It's like for Tibbs, it's like, yeah. why do you play your players too long? Why is it always isolation heavy offense? Why can't you do, why can't you deviate for something else? Is there something that fans just get on Spolstra about? They're like, why do you do this? That's a good question. Uh, well, every fan will get on every coach. It's the easy. Oh, but you don't need to tell me that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, dude, I like I said, I covered the Warriors in the Heat. I you could you could argue that if you said Steve Kerr and Eric Spolstra were the two best head coaches in the league over like the last ten years, you I would believe like you have a credible argument for that position. And yet, Warriors fans and Heat fans both hate these coaches sometimes. Like, there's I shouldn't say all of them. There's a segment of Heat fans and Warriors fans that think mm-hmm. they're the worst coach in the league and that they should be fired. Uh, so that said, I, I think that maybe the number one gripe for Heat fans is that uh, Spo doesn't like, like, just doesn't want to play big players. That he's got like a th- ever since he moved Chris Bosch to the five, which by the way led to a title. People do like that decision led to their first championship in the Big Three era. Ever since he did that, there's been a segment of Heat fans that have just wished for the days of Alonzo Mourning again, where you had a traditional mm. center in the in the middle of the paint. Uh, they think because that the Heat are not big. Um, you know, traditionally big, that they're a bad rebounding team. The Heat are actually an elite rebounding team this year uh, because 
they box out because they play hard, and that's really what rebounding is all about. It's not really about being seven feet. Being seven feet obviously helps, but if if five players are boxing out and working hard and trying to get the rebounds, you're going to be a good rebounding team. Um, I would say that's probably the main thing is that he doesn't like size, and then every every fan you know second guesses a coach's rotation decisions, and I think rotation decisions are so overrated in terms of actually meaning anything in terms of winning and losing uh, in the grand scheme of things, but. Um, in terms of like a spo specific complaint, it's that he, he just he hates large humans. I suppose is, is the the status <laughs> of uh, some Heat fans. That is quite the opposite of Tom Thibodeau because we need a true right. protector at all times, which I'm fine with. I mean, Mitchell Robinson's been awesome for us this season. He just yes. came back from injury, four games in a row. He's posted up a double double. He's averaged at least one block of one steal per game as well since his return. And, you know, Knicks, you talk about energy and effort and creating a culture. That is what Tom Thibodeau has done here as well. They play defense. They're gritty. They, they compete night in and night out. At the beginning of the season, you thought he was going to get fired because that colossal loss to the Dallas Mavericks, that first game in December. Yeah. And you're just like, how can you give up such – how can you allow such a loss to happen? Or even against the Atlanta Hawks earlier in the year where you're up 20 and then you lose. Stuff like that, you thought Tibbs was going to be out, but then he shortened his rotation to nine – Guys started playing defense. Now we get Josh Hart in here. Haven't lost a game since Josh Hart has joined this team. And this team has just been clicking on all cylinders right now, and they're playing gritty defense. Their offense is taking another step, and they're buying into the culture of you don't stop until the whistle blows. And that is something that when you talk about coaching, setting a culture, guys buying in, you know, you also need the right guys to do that, of course. But that is something Tibbs has done here since he's been with this organization from day one. And kind of why I've been, you know, not quick to to fire him. I was like, yo, you need to give this guy another season coach of the year and so forth. So I totally echo the same sentiments they have for Eric Spolstra. But you brought this guy's name up. So I guess I got to bring it up because Knicks fans are going to be asking, why didn't I talk about it? Sorry about Pat Riley for just a quick second. Got to bring up the the Sith Lord himself. You know, I read, shout out to Chris Herring. He was a guest on the show. Uh, read Blood in the Garden. Awesome book. And you just get the glimpse of just how Pat Riley is. So quick hitter question. What's it been like having him oversee the Miami Heat organization? Yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. You, you think about like the biggest figures in NBA history, even, and Pat Riley is, is on the short list, right? I mean, just the, with his stint with the Lakers and the Knicks and, and what he's done now in Miami, uh, basically building uh, one of the most successful franchises in the NBA from scratch, right? Like he he didn't come he didn't he didn't come to Miami year one of the Heat, um, but he came pretty soon and he changed everything. Uh, and a lot of that is in uh, Chris Herring's book, by the way, which is it's a good shout out. It's a great book. Um, but the fact that he just came in and was like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna come from storied organizations that already had sort of like kind of a institutional equity and knowledge and things of way of doing things like the Lakers and the Knicks. I'm going to go to Miami and just and just build it from the ground up. And then he did. And and you, you're hard-pressed to find many NBA franchises that have had more success in, in his 30-year run. Uh, and so, yeah, having him here in Miami, just talking as a South Florida sports fan, we're, we're also rooting for the Miami Dolphins and the Miami Marlins and, like, these teams that just can't seem to get out of their own ways over the last 30 years, um, to have a consistent – team and yeah year to year every you know fan bases have their gripes about the team and maybe this season hasn't gone the way that heat fans had hoped but overall like heat fans have been spoiled in this market with how successful and how consistently this organization and this team wins and that started with pat riley look seeing it like after reading the book seeing it and just like how he's created that you just see it it just oozes on the court just like the culture like it leads yeah. goes down top down for the way the miami heat do it and that's kind of like the sting about it because the Nick, the new, when you think about the 90s Knicks before he left and then uh, Van Gundy took over, you just see that grit, that hard nosed mentality, and, and you miss it. But then you see it against this team and that we had a face throughout the 90s. And you have Tim Hardaway, you have Alonzo Warren. You're like, oh my goodness gracious, just get out, get out of my hair, get out of my hair. But we got to keep the show moving along. I don't want to, I don't want to reminisce on that because I know Knicks fans may just leave the show early. So once again, we're talking to Wes Goldberg. You can find him over at the Locked on Heat. He's the host of that podcast, and he's got bylines at the Ringer and the Miami Herald. All right, Wes, let's get into this game preview and wrap this show up. All right, so I'm looking at the marquee matchup for this game as Julius Randle 
versus Bam Adebayo. And it feels like you go on Twitter and it's always an argument between these two names. It's either like why Julius is better than Bam and why Bam is better than Julius, even though they're one's a power forward, one's a center. But it always comes back down to like who should be the all-star over who. That's why I always feel like the, the gripe of the argument is. But I'm looking at this matchup. I think it's going to be marquee because Julius Randle, you know, through the last seven games, through this seven-game winning streak, he's shooting 49% from the field. He's shooting 40% from three, and that's on high volume too, shooting nine and a half uh, threes per game. He's averaging 27 points as well with seven rebounds, four assists. Dude's just been on one. He's been a catalyst and one of the main reasons next to Jalen Brunson for why the Knicks have been succeeding this season. And then I look at Bam Adebayo, you know, defensive stalwart, right? He's good within, within the paint. He's the, he, he is that, he is that tone setter. When you think about defense, that paint presence, that's what Bam Adebayo brings. So is, what do you think about this matchup? And is there any other matchups that we should be looking for? I love this matchup for all the things that you're saying. Like in some ways, Bam and and Randall are very similar. Um, they're similar size. They're both great athletes at their position. Um, they they both do most of their damage in the mid range. They get their sweet spots. Julius Randall obviously can do stuff from the three point line. That's not part of Bam's game whatsoever. Uh, Bam is better defensively than Julius Randall is. Both of them are very good passers. Uh, both of them are very versatile modern big. So I understand why the comparison is made. Um, although it's not like a like for like comparison, but I get it. And they both, you know, one plays for the Heat, one plays for the Knicks, and that helps too. So yeah, that to me is the biggest matchup of this game. Last time these two teams played uh, at Madison Square Garden, Bam had 32 points, Randall had 23, the Knicks got the win. Um, yeah, so this is this is always an interesting matchup just to see how Bam is going to let, like what what is Bam going to let Julius Randall have? And what is Julius Randall going to take advantage of? And then on the on the other side of the court, can Julius Randle kind of amp up his defensive game to match what Bam Adebayo is going to bring? And so, um, yeah, it's always it's always a great matchup. In terms of what else I'm looking at, um, I, I do, they got to stop Jalen Brunson because this dude is on fire right now. Mm. I, I and I don't really know who does it. If I'm being honest, they'll they'll start probably Gabe Vincent on him again. Kyle Lowry ruled out for the game, so they'll probably start with Gabe Vincent guarding Jalen Brunson. But it's going to take more than just Gabe Vincent. It's and, and Gabe Vincent's a solid perimeter defender, but it's going to take more than that. Um, Heat like to switch a lot. Julius Randle likes to. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jalen Brunson likes to hunt those switches and get to his spots. He loves that little turnaround, high post, shimmy yep. nonsense footwork thing that he does. <laughs> that goes in. Hey, every don't call time. it nonsense, man. It's magic. It is magic. It is magic. Magic is a good word. I honestly don't know what it is. I I love watching Jalen Brunson. I have nothing against Jalen Brunson, but it is absolute nonsense what he's doing on the court. Like it is ridiculous. Um, who defends that? I I think that we're gonna see stretches of Jimmy Butler on Jalen Brunson. Um, also for whatever reason, R.J. Barrett has turned in himself into something of a heat killer. I know that Knicks fans are not super psyched about his development this year, but if R.J. Player, Barrett played the Miami Heat every single game, he'd be averaging thirty points a game. Uh, he, for whatever reason, he just goes off against Miami. So who covers R.J. It. Barrett? Who who limits R.J. Barrett is another thing that I'm interested to look at. And the new thing in this matchup is what we talked about earlier was the Kevin Love edition. Where do you put him? Are you going to line him up against a center, uh, you know, whether it's Mitchell Robinson or Isaiah Hartenstein and and all these other guys? Like, So where do you where do you put Kevin Love? Where do you hide him defensively? Um, certainly not going to be on Julius Randle, that's for sure. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting matchups in this one. Yeah, for sure. And just con just to confirm, is Jimmy Butler in for tomorrow? Because I think I saw something today that he was out. So I'm not one hundred percent out. Not one hundred percent sure. But you know, some of the matchups that I'm looking at too is like you, you talk about Bam and Randall. I think that it's going to be mostly Mitchell Robinson guarding Bam at a bio. Uh, when you're talking about mm -hmm. the Knicks being on defense, Miami being on offense, and I want to see how Mitch is going to be able be able to handle him because he wasn't there the last game that the Heat and the Knicks faced off. So I'd like to see if he can continue this hot streak against Bam. And then on top of that, you know, I'm looking at Tyler Hero because you're talking about a three-point shooter. You got to keep, you got to try to maintain him. He's good off movement. You know, he's good at relocating. He's going to have the ball in his hand. He's a creator as well. So I'm looking to see, you know, I know quickly he's going to be out there. There's going to be Josh Hart. I'm going to watch to see how we didn't have Josh Hart the last time. Is Tyler Hero going to be able to take that type of physicality if you put Josh Hart on Tyler Hero. So, yep. And Tyler Hero 
being able to take the physicality from Josh Hart is what I'm talking about. So these are the type of matchups that I'm looking for into the game as well. And I think it's going to be a good match. I think it's going to come mostly towards the starters, who's going to get hot and who's going to be playing gritty defense. And yeah, I think the for, for Jalen Brunson though, you know, he was taking advantage of Macau Bridges yesterday who was on him. So it's like when he's in his bag, it is very difficult to stop. And there's just been nothing but praises around Knicks nation when it comes to Jalen Brunson, but moving along, you know, we have the battle of the benches, right? So thankfully our bench is now starting to come together with the addition of Josh Hart with him, Emmanuel quickly, Obi Toppin, Isaiah Hartenstein, like between it's mostly quick and Hart because those guys could be playmakers quickly is a good shooter. They both can play off of one another and just let the other one roam. And their defense is just relentless. You know, it was McBride and quickly for a little bit, but McBride didn't really give that offense. Now with Hart out there, he's a one-man band man when it comes to transition scoring. You know, his three-point shot has just been insane the last couple of games. Was Josh Hart right now is shooting 60% from three, 61, 62% from the field. And it's just, you know, he's averaging, where is it? Where's the scoring right now? He is averaging. 15. No, that's not it. He's averaging 12, po 12 points per game. So he's doing some work. He's doing some damage off the bench, which has just been great for us. And having that, I want to know, what do you think the Miami Heat are going to do to try to counter that type of bench? Uh, hope that they make outside shots. That's sort mm -hmm. of what Miami's bench has come down to this year. Um, look, the Knicks bench, like you said, it's completely solidified. You feel really good about what the Knicks, for, like top nine and ten guys in their rotation are. Quickly has been playing some of the best basketball of his career. Josh Hart has been a perfect Nick uh, ever since they got him. Um, the Heat have been hoping for more from their guys. Like Victor Oladipo recently came back. He hasn't looked great coming back from this injury that he was dealing with. Um, without Kyle Lowry, Gabe Vincent's a starter, not part of your bench unit. So they've been trying to figure out, all right, with just one sort of traditional point guard, how do we sort of stagger our lineups so that we have some ball handling on the floor at all times? And so that's been a little funky for them. Um, it's been a little discombobulated, but what they're really trying to get to and what I've been kind of watching is, is Victor Oladipo and Cody Zeller played together at Indiana. And they're obviously trying to tap into whatever chemistry still exists eight years later or however long it's been. And, mm -hmm. and so they'll, they've will they been, like, running some pick and roll and some stuff like that, trying to create that as sort of their anchor sort of set for that bench offense. So that's been interesting. Um, and then in terms of uh, what they're doing defensively, it's just it's a lot of zone. They like to run a lot of 2-3 zone when the, when the second unit is in, um, a lot of press zone as well to kind of throw guys off their, uh, off their rhythm. That could impact quickly and Josh Hart too. So um, – It'll be interesting. The, the bench for them is, is sort of evolving and sort of a game-to-game -game thing about whether or not it, it, it plays well because it, it'll, it'll literally come down to guys like Caleb Martin, Max Strews, Gabe Vincent, like these guys, Victor Oladipo. Are they making their outside shots or not? The last time these teams played, Miami's bench outscored the Knicks bench by one point, 29 to 28. I would be surprised if Miami's bench outscored the Knicks in this one. I think if the Heat are going to win this game, it's going to be their starters really stepping up. And to answer your question earlier about Jimmy Butler, he's listed as questionable. He's listening as questionable. Okay, so he's listed as questionable tomorrow. Let's see if he plays. Um, two quick hitters, and then I'm going to ask the final the the prediction of this game. What happened to Duncan Robinson and Victor Oladipo, man? <laughs> uh, Duncan Robinson um, got in a shooting slump last year at the beginning of last year. Never really recovered from it, and then um, when he's never been a great defender, right? But when you're an elite shooter make like like literally shooting the three ball like like Steph Curry, Damian Lillard numbers, then you live with the defensive deficiencies. Um but then once you come down to a little bit like league average, which is where he was last year, then you don't really want to live with those the defensive issues anymore. And he fouls a lot and it's frustrating and it because you know when you foul, obviously you're sending the other team to the line, but you're stopping the game. You're you're creating foul out situations and putting your team in the bonus early in quarters and things like that. And you just don't want to do that. And so he found and then the emergence of Max Struess last year was like okay we have this other shooter we don't really need this other shooter we, the one that we just paid five years 90 million dollars to we're gonna put him on the bench so he's basically found himself out of the rotation ever since then he got back in the rotation earlier this year to see okay can you was last year an anomaly can you get back to kind of shooting at 40 percent from three he didn't he got hurt uh he had surgery on the on his uh 
on one of his fingers on a shooting hand that kept him out for a couple of months. He just recently got back right before the all-star break and he's kind of found minutes here and there, but hasn't worked his way back into the rotation. So uh, Duncan Robinson is a TBD at this point, uh, not really a factor in Miami's night to night rotation. Um, and in terms of Victor Oladipo, man, it's, it sucks, but like, it's just, it's one injury after another. He ha- he has a hard time mm-hmm. staying healthy for a month straight. And, and when you're just, when it's like that, it, it's impossible to find a rhythm. And he just, he'll have like a week where he looks like a potential six man of the year. And then he'll tweak his ankle or hurt his abdomen or whatever it's going to be. And then, and then he's out for another month. And so it's unfortunate for Victor Oladipo because he really wants it. Uh, I wrote a, I wrote a feature on him for the ringer last year when he first came back after a year and a half away from the mm-hmm. game. And um, he really, he really wants it, and he really puts the work in. He really works hard, but unfortunately, his body just keeps uh, breaking down. And and sometimes that's just those are the cards that some of these guys get dealt. Unfortunately, that's unfortunate, especially for Old Depot man, because he was killing it out in Indiana. Oh yeah, you know? and it just stinks to see a player who was so good now is just on his way. It's good to seem like he's going to be on the way out of the league because of just constant injuries. That stinks for him, but. Wes, thank you for coming on to the show. Really appreciate it. Final question. What do you predict the final score of this game will be? Final score. Um, I'm going to go 107 to 102. 107 to 102. Heat win. Jimmy Butler plays. Okay. Has a really big night. The Heat lost a tough one Wednesday night against Philly. They're going to bounce back. They're going to come back strong. They're going to want to end this little Knicks run. The Heat, it's been inconsistent for them, but when they're really motivated, they're a tough team to beat, I think, and it's at home, obviously, in Miami, so I think the Heat get this one. It's funny that you give that type of score, and I'm like, wow, that's a defensive game. <laughs> Not for the Heat. That's like a high-scoring game for the Heat this year. <laughs> I know, but for, like, just the NBA at large, it's like, oh, right. like, the Knicks just put up, like, 142 points against the, right. the Brooklyn Nets, and it's like, wow, this is we're talking about defense, I guess. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, the Heat didn't get the memo this year. <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go because I feel like this is gonna be a gritty matchup. I feel like this is gonna be a gritty matchup. I'll go 110, 105. Actually, 110, 105. This is it's gonna be closer than that. It's gonna be 110, 108. Knicks. It's gonna be a close one. I feel. I feel like it's gonna be. I feel like it's gonna be a gritty close one. That's just how. Look, it's history in the making. It's it's the Knicks Heat. Yeah. Long rivalry. That's that's the only way this way can, can end up. But Wes, th- once again, thank you for coming on. Appreciate the time. Please let our listeners know where they could find your work and if you got anything coming up that we should be on the on the lookout for. Yeah, uh, you can always check out if you want to listen to the Miami Heat stuff for some reason as a Knicks fan. Check out Locked On Heat. I also do Locked On NBA every Thursday night, Friday morning, so that'll be out Friday morning. Uh, I'm recapping all the Thursday night's actions and biggest stories every week. And then, uh, yeah, we're working on some other stories. So uh, follow me on Twitter at WC Goldberg and uh, you'll see where they drop. Awesome. Wes, once again, thank you for coming on and salute to Knicks nation for tuning in once again, to check this game of the week preview between the New York Knicks and the Miami heat. Make sure to go to KnicksFanTV.com and support the website. You can always find Remy's recap after every single game. He breaks down the game in full detail. So if you need, if you didn't catch the game and you need to know who played well, Remy's got you covered. And last and certainly not least, please make sure to subscribe. Please make to share these videos. All right. And if you can't follow us on YouTube and check out the videos when they premiere, you can always follow us on any audio listening platform. We're on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, Amazon, Alexa Stitch, you name it. We're all over the place. All right, Next Nation. We'll catch you later. We out. <laughs>